Chapter 15 of AMSCO U.S. History, Reconstruction from 1863 to 1877. As always, thanks so much for supporting this channel and make sure to promote this to your friends so they can help me grow this channel too. So as the Confederates were able to win a few more battles and gain the momentum in the war, President Lincoln thought up this plan for reconstructing the Union after the war would end. So this was the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction in 1863. Basically, its goal was to reconstruct the state governments in the South so that the Unionists were in charge rather than the Confederates or Secessionists. So part of this plan was that full presidential pardons would be granted to most Confederates who A. took an oath of allegiance to the Union and the U.S. Constitution, and two, accepted the emancipation of slaves. A second part of this was that a state government could be reestablished and accepted as legitimate by the U.S. President as soon as 10% of the voters in that state took the loyalty oath. And also, every southern state would have to rewrite its state constitution to eliminate slavery and sort of make his emancipation proclamation more, have, more important in the Union. So after the war had finally ended, some things occurred as part of this reconstruction. One was in March 1865, Congress created an important new agency, and this was the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, or known as the Freedmen's Bureau. And basically, this was like an early welfare agency. It helped both blacks, the new freed slaves, and also homeless whites of the South. It basically helped confiscate these old lands by these plantation owners in the South and gave them to these landless people. But ultimately, President Johnson did not really follow through with this. The greatest success, however, was in education. So by the end of it, there were so many new schools with federal funding that taught a lot of people how to read, primarily African Americans who weren't allowed to under slavery. Lincoln's 10% plan for Reconstruction, as talked about earlier, was basically part of his proclamation of amnesty and Reconstruction. Basically, a state government could be reestablished, part of the Union, as long as 10% of the voters in the state took the loyalty oath. On the other hand, there was Johnson's Reconstruction plan. So, of course, Lincoln got assassinated in April 1865, and so his vice president, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, took power. And Johnson was from the South, of course, so he wasn't really all about Lincoln and the Republicans' plan, so he had his own. And basically, what his plan called for was that he didn't like the Southern aristocrats who led the Confederacy, so he issued his own plan, which was basically really similar to Lincoln's 10%. But it also said that all former leaders and office holders of the Confederacy and Confederates with more than 20000 in taxable property were not allowed to hold office or vote. And this was sort of great for the Northerners, except he also included this escape clause for the wealthy planters. Basically, you could buy your way out of it, and Johnson would grant you a presidential pardon. This plan was especially thought of corrupt by the radical Republicans. So Republicans, by the time of Lincoln, had divided into two classes, basically the moderates, who were all for the economic gains of the white middle class, and the radicals, who were all for the civil rights of blacks. And basically, these new Republicans became radical because they feared that a reunified Democratic Party that had split before might again be dominant. So they didn't want that to happen. And so there were leading Republicans, such as Sumner of Massachusetts, you may remember him from getting caned. He was in the Senate. And then there was also Stevens of Pennsylvania, who thought to revolutionize Southern society. And these people, they wanted to ex have an extended period of military rule in which African Americans would be free to exercise their civil rights. African Americans could also get educated in schools operated by the federal government, and they would also receive lands confiscated from the planter class, as talked about earlier. And these people, they really sometimes also endorse other liberal causes, such as women's suffrage, rights for labor unions, and civil rights for Northern African Americans. Although it was a struggle for these people to implement the plan, it would have a big effect later on. These Republicans further hated it when Johnson and some southern state legislatures adopted black codes that basically restricted the rights and movements of these former slaves. So these codes prohibited blacks from either renting land or borrowing money to buy land, and it placed these men into semi-bondage by forcing them to sign work contracts, and also prohibited blacks from testifying against whites in court. So this contract labor system really was no different from slavery, and it was bad for these new freed men. 
As part of the congressional reconstruction plan, such as by the radical Republicans, they wanted to make sure the African Americans truly had their civil rights exercised. So one of the things they passed was the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and this basically pronounced that all African Americans were U.S. citizens, so that made Dred Scott not a thing anymore. And it also provided a legal shield against the operation of the black codes, as seen earlier. So Johnson and the Republicans really didn't get along well because, of course, Johnson was like a Democrat from the South before. And so Congress passed the Tenure of Office Act, and it was basically prohibiting the president from removing a federal official or military commander without the approval of the Senate. So at the time, one of the radical Republicans was Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. And so Johnson didn't think this was constitutional, so he dismissed Stanton, and the House responded by impeaching him, charging him with 11 high crimes and misdemeanors. And so with this, Johnson significantly became the first president to be impeached. However, the Senate later acquitted him by just only one vote, so the Senate fell one vote short of the necessary two-thirds, and it was because several moderate Democrats thought that removing a president because of political reasons was a bad idea. So ultimately, Johnson was not removed from office. The Republicans, though, had other things they wanted to pass, and one was the 14th and 15th Amendments. And so the 14th Amendment was basically used to support the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And it was passed in 1868. And basically, it declared that all people born or naturalized in the United States were citizens. So, of course, it still occurs today. And also, it obligated the states to respect the rights of U.S. citizens and provide them with equal protection of the laws and due process of the law. So this would help the newly freed blacks as well. And it also included stuff that basically required states as well as the federal government to uphold the rights of citizens. So no more like pushing down on minorities and other people. It also had some things specifically related to Reconstruction and the Confederates, but that's not really important today. Also, there was the 15th Amendment, and this was basically when, in 1869, they wanted to secure the vote for all African Americans, because in some places in the South, that was not happening very often. And basically, adding one more Reconstruction Amendment to the 13th and 14th passed earlier really helped prohibit any state from denying a citizen's right to vote based on race, color, or other conditions of servitude. And it was ratified in 1870. So the last part of civil rights reform was enacted by Congress in 1875, and that was the Civil Rights Act of 1865. This basically guaranteed equal accommodations in public places, so hotels, railroads, and theaters. And it prohibited courts from excluding these African Americans from juries as well. This, however, was poorly enforced because moderate and conservative Republicans really didn't want to reform this unwilling South, which really was not willing to accept this, and they also didn't want to lose the white votes in the North. So by 1877, this also signaled the end of Reconstruction completely. So the South's agricultural economy was definitely terminated, sort of, after the Civil War, and landowners lost their compulsory labor force and slaves. But they also tried to attempt to force these freed African Americans into signing contracts, as mentioned earlier, to work these fields. And these contracts were all about like permanent and unrestricted labor. And it was basically slavery by a different name. It really didn't help the African Americans, and many of them went into the system of tenancy and sharecropping. And under the system of sharecropping, the landlord usually provided like seed and other farm supplies, but they usually got a share back, usually half of the harvest. And although this gave poor people of the South, so like whites and blacks, the opportunity to work land for themselves, they usually sold a lot of it by the end and didn't get to keep a lot of it. And many times they were in debt to local merchants. So by the end, like 1880, no more than 5% of these African Americans had become independent landowners. So it was really just this new bad form of servitude. After the war, there were northern newcomers known as carpetbaggers because they usually brought carpet bags with them to try to plunder what was left of the South and make themselves beneficial. And there were also these scalawags, and scalawags were what Democratic opponents called Southern Republicans. And basically, these were many times former Whigs who were really interested in economic development for their state and peace between the sections. And Northerners really just wanted to come to the South to try to set up new businesses, and even ministers and teachers wanted to 
do great things for the South, but many other people, as mentioned before, really just wanted to steal from the South what little they had left. By the end of the war, this new freedom for all these African Americans really meant that new black communities could spring up, and one of these were through churches. And one of the most prominent churches was the African Methodist Episcopal Churches. And so after a war, many, there were many new black ministers who emerged as leaders in the African American community, and churches sprang up as well. Also central to this like new African American development was the foundation of black colleges, and one of them was Morehouse College. And this was basically established during Reconstruction to help prepare African American black ministers and teachers. Located in Atlanta, it is still active today. Also, there were the slaughterhouse cases at this time, and it basically rose through this slaughterhouse case in Louisiana where there were these butchers who were arguing over their citizenship versus this big monopoly that had taken over. And basically what the court ruled at the end was that a person's citizenship was really based on the federal level and cannot be guaranteed by the states. So even though the federal government protected your citizenship, the state's government unfortunately didn't support it and therefore that was up for interpretation. It was a big deal because the dissenters argued that like these new laws, such as the 14th Amendment, did not only protect slaves, they were to protect everyone and their property, including these white people who were butchers at the time. Corruption was a big deal at this time, and one of them was the whiskey ring scandal. And it was basically where federal revenue agents conspired with the liquor industry to defraud the government on millions of dollars. So these people were supposed to collect taxes and stuff, but they really were involved in a lot of bribery and it hurt the federal government in the end. So near the end of Reconstruction, radical Republicans were waning, and Southern conservatives, known as Redeemers, took control of one state government after another. So these were like the people from the Confederacy, and this process really helped to initiate these new agendas, such as states' rights, reduced taxes, reduced spending on social programs, and white supremacy. So this new wave of Southern Democrats was starting to bloom again. So... After the war, there were problems such as white supremacy and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan or KKK, and these problems really threatened the new civil rights of African Americans. And so to give federal authorities the power to stop the KKK's violence and protect the civil rights of citizens in the South, Congress passed the Force Acts of 1870 and 1871. Near the end of Grand Second Term, there was this big economic disaster known as the Panic of 1873, basically over speculation by financiers and the overbuilding of industry and railroads in the North led to widespread business failures and depression, and everyone was really affected and these debts on farms and cities really grew a lot. And also not helping the cause was tight money policies. So at this time, the money was backed by gold, but these people, once again, like during the war, demanded the creation of greenback paper money that was not backed by gold. But finally, Grant decided to side with the hard money bankers and creditors and vetoed a bill calling for the release of additional greenbacks. To end Grant's two terms in office, there was the election of 1876, which sort of rounds up this chapter. And basically, in the election of 1876, the Republicans looked for a person that wasn't touched by corruption like the Grant administration and nominated the governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes. And the Democrats chose a reform governor from New York, Samuel J. Tilden. And he really wanted to fight corruption, such as the Tweed Ring back in the day. And at the end of this, it was really tight, but Tilden only needed one electoral vote from South Carolina, Florida, or Louisiana, but didn't get it, and ultimately, Hayes and the Republicans had won once again. And at the end of this special election, there was this special electoral commission that was created to determine who won these disputed votes of the three states. And in a straight party vote of eight to seven, the Republicans chose to give the electoral votes to Hayes. And the Democrats really didn't like this, so they wanted to filibuster the results and send the election to the House, which they controlled, but it didn't work out because the leaders of the two parties decided to have an informal deal, the Compromise of 1877. The Democrats would allow this Republican, Hayes, to become president, but he would, one, immediately end federal support for the Republicans in the South, and two, support the building of a Southern Transcontinental Railroad. So to develop the industry and infrastructure in the South was a big deal. And this was basically the end of the protection of African Americans and Republicans in the South. And this end of federal military presence really just 
ended up bringing Reconstruction to an end. The Supreme Court struck down one Reconstruction law after another, and supporters of the New South wanted new industrial development. But in many parts, Southern African Americans and whites were not a part of this, and they remained poor and further behind the rest of the nation. So this has been Chapter 15, Reconstruction from 1863 to 1877. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you in the next one when we continue the story of America.